Hey there. Today is the 14th of April. This is Medusa was framed and my name is Joyce. Today, I would like to talk to you about the trolley park that once existed in Jacksonville, Florida called Dixieland Park. Jacksonville is the city on the Georgia border. It was a very large city, still is very large city, very important in the history of Florida and uh, many other things we came to find out. I just found out about Dixieland Park and that was just one of those things that happens when you're snooping around on the internet and you're looking at uh, this and that. Sometimes the way you phrase your queries in DuckDuckGo or Google, you find marvelous things. Or when you're looking at old photos, which is how I spend most of my time, old photos and old maps, you see something spectacular and think, oh my God, what is that? And that's how I found Dixieland Park. So um, it's not a, a small story or a short story. And I have managed to collect the photos that were available. Sadly, there weren't that many to be had. Um, so I'm just gonna start the slideshow and start telling you a story. And then as I've done in the past, we'll go back and we can go photo by photo and talk about specifics. So let me go ahead and put this on slideshow. Okay, and thank you for being here. So I'm just gonna read while you look at photos. So Dixieland Park opened in what is now considered South Side of Jacksonville, meaning it's on the south side of the St. John's River in 1907 in March. At the time it was referred to as the Coney Island of the South, Florida's playground with more free attractions than anywhere in the entire South, Jacksonville's greatest resort, the best roller coaster South of New York City, the finest merry-go-round outside of Coney Island, Dixieland Park. She was only open for 10 years, sad enough. And it came at a hard time, a Renaissance time in Jacksonville, actually. There had been one of many fires as we know, researching these wonderful old anomalies in technology, there are always these convenient fires that take things out. Most of Florida was burned more than once due to warring occupations of the Spanish were in control, the British were in control, the Spanish were in control, and the indigenous people that were being wiped off the map. So a lot of destruction. There was a massive fire, now referred to as the Great Fire in 1901 in Jacksonville. 146 blocks were destroyed in eight hours. It was not that long before that in 1865 that the Union soldiers who came down raised the city and burned it down. But in 1901, 466 acres were burned, 2,368 buildings were destroyed, which left 10,000 people homeless. What came after that was a post-fire renaissance, as they referred to it, and Dixieland was part of that. The city of Jacksonville at the time was on the north side of the river at the place where the river was the narrowest. Jacksonville used to be known as Cowcross 
where the cows would cross, the narrowest place. This was on the south side, which was not an incorporated area at the time. Dixieland Park took up 21 acres on 1,100 feet of riverfront. If you have been to Jacksonville on the south side, you can find the old dimensions of Dixieland on Flagler Avenue on the east side and Prudential Drive on the west side. So essentially across the Main Street Bridge, the old blue drawbridge. A 10 cent admission got you into Dixieland Park with remarkable attractions. There was a 160 foot bamboo slide called the Dixie Drew Drop. A 160 foot roller coaster called the Flying Jenny. A figure eight ride, a toboggan ride, what was called a laughing gallery. I think we would call that a fun house. What they called the House of Troubles, which I imagine is like the scary house or whatever. Extensive botanical gardens, a movie theater, a silent movie theater, and that is because films were being, silent films were being made in Jacksonville at the time. There was a separate admission for the movie theater, 25 cents, 50 cents, and 75 cents, depending on the time. Featured animal shows that include ostrich, elephants, tigers, camels, horses, alligators, dog and pony shows, lion wrestlings, and trained chimps. All of these animals being brought in for the movie industry. Hot air balloon rides, parachute jumps, comedy acrobats, high wire acts, a swimming pool with a manufactured beach, fireworks shows every night, burrow rides, goat wagon rides, and opera shows. A mystery house, a doomsday place, daredevil attraction, and, and there's the photo, <laughs> baby incubators. Baby incubator attractions. Anyone who has watched other people's videos like Michelle Gibson about trolley parks or the world's fairs or such things know about the baby incubator attractions. This was the first in Florida and it gave premature babies all over Florida an opportunity to be cared for in a sterile professional environment. More about that to come. Some of the special features at Dixieland were Madame Morelli and her 12 Jaguars, the beer drinking chimp who ate cheese sandwiches in a top hat and tux while smoking cigars, a bowling elephant, a horseback riding lion, a magnolia lined waterfront. Now, before I go on with that, I just want to ask you, Magnolia lined waterfront. How long does it take a magnolia to grow to shade a waterfront? I'll just leave that there. All that is left of Dixieland Park is that tree right there, the treaty oak. And that still stands exactly obviously where it was in the part of town that is now called San Marco, which is a beautiful area across the Main Street Bridge where there are lovely old homes, uh, a historical theater, some wonderful small restaurants, lots of uh, preserved architecture. The Treaty Oak now is over nine feet in diameter. There was also a portion of Dixieland Park that had 
the large buildings with themes, as we see in all of the world's fairs and types of things. There was a building that was about produce of the tropics, a building about Florida industry, and modern transportation. Another feature was Salvo, the human skyrocket, who on a 75 foot slide would ride his bicycle to build up momentum, which would then cast he and the bike into the air, and then he would fall onto a trampoline, 30 feet in the air. There were staged reenactments of the Jonestown flood, which the Jonestown flood happened in 1889. It was when there was a dam, the South Fork dam collapsed, releasing 14 million cubic meters of water and was quite catastrophic, as you can imagine. Also, there was a reenactment of the Mount Pele eruption, which happened in 1902 in Martinique, which prior to that had been considered the Paris of the Caribbean. Can't imagine how those reenactments would have been done, but we won't stop there. There was also Champion, the trick dog. There was Talon, the lion tamer. There was Mademoiselle Gregory and her thrilling leap from her flying automobile. There was Council the Second, who was a chimp who ate with a knife and fork and drank champagne. Now, Dixieland was built next to an attraction that was already there. And that was the ballpark. You've already seen photos of the ballpark go by. That was built in 1904, the baseball field, which became the spring training grounds for the New York Yankees, the Brooklyn Dodgers, the Philadelphia Athletic League, the Cincinnati Reds, and the Boston Braves. Oh, and I forgot on my list of attractions, Mademoiselle Aurora and her polar bears. So this was a lot of show and a lot of entertainment for 10 cents. Things that made this park unique, as is the case with every trolley park or World's Fair, were electricity. Now, we have to take into consideration that Edison had a summer house here, not in Jacksonville, actually on the west side of Florida, on the Gulf of Mexico side and hours south. Um, but nonetheless, he had a summer house here and he did work here. And he is attributed with stringing and lighting uh, Dixieland. And one of the attractions was people could see the lights of Dixieland across the St. John's River. There was an electric water fountain in Dixieland, which is also attributed to Edison. Japanese lanterns with electric light. There were 20,000 electric lights strung all over Dixieland. And as you can see in some of the shots um, around the Treaty Oak as well, there was a 12 inch steam gauge railroad. So now a little relativity in the 1900s, the population of Florida was estimated at being 529,000. There's the ballpark. Florida was mostly agricultural and frontier, and most people lived within 50 miles of the Georgia border. Jacksonville is just far less than that from, depending on where in Jacksonville, it, it just about goes right up to the Georgia border. Florida is known for having the longest consecutive coastline in the United States. 825 miles of accessible beach. And there is nowhere in Florida where you are any more than 60 miles away from salt water, whether the, it's, it's the Atlantic or the Caribbean. This has always been 
a key to tourism here. Edison came to Florida in 1885. He set up his summer house in Fort Myers, which is in Southwest Florida on the uh, Gulf of Mexico side. In 1878, Edison is attributed with creating the electric phonograph. His company, of course, became GE. 1874, he improved on Morris's invention of the 1840s by making the electric telegraph. In 1870s, he created the vacuum light bulb, so the light bulb we know. Also in the 1870s, he was involved in the creation of the kinetograph, which was an early motion picture filming device. And of course, this had a lot to do with why Florida and specifically Jacksonville was a silent movie haven. And then his creating the alkaline storage battery in 1910 helped his good buddy, Henry Ford, who also built a summer house down that away on the Southwest side with coming to Florida. Um, there was a Ford Motor Company factory in Jacksonville. And of course, having that here had a lot to do with the decline of the popularity of a trolley park, trolley park being the amusement park at the end of the line, but also with trolleys in general, because the impetus was to get people into cars and abandon the trolleys. Another story, but not an unusual one. Now there were a couple horrible hailstorms that impacted Jacksonville and severely impacted Dixieland. Just a couple months after Dixieland opened in 1907, there was the worst hailstone in history uh, with hail being reported to be the size of softballs. It took down the Flying Jenny roller coaster. It took down and twisted the dewdrop slide. It tore the roof off the House of Trouble and slammed it into the Dixie Theater, shattering the glass and flooding the playhouse. But it was repaired, it was reopened, and the money was made. In fact, the restoration and reopening of Dixieland at the time was such a matter of celebration that the Payne Pyrotechnic Company from New York City agreed to come down and have a monster bash to celebrate the restoration and reopening of Dixieland, where they spent a few evenings shooting off rockets along with the fireworks. So on to the story about the movie production. So movies were produced in the Jacksonville area, some of which there on stages at Disney, uh, Dixieland between 1908 and 1918. Probably most notable, not of Dixieland, but of a movie that was filmed in the Jacksonville area is either The Creature from the Black Lagoon in the 1950s or some of the swampy jungle scenes from G.I. Jane. Those were also filmed in Jacksonville. So as a place to take film production, Jacksonville was seen as a city of great asset and it became the winter film capital of the world. There were over 400 silent films done in Jacksonville. At the time, the biggest draw was Tom Mix and his police vaudeville. Also, there were Laurel and Hardy films made here. At the time, Edison owned most of the patents on the actual cameras, and Eastman Kodak owned the patents on the raw film stock. 
So Edison was able to put a squeeze on people and control production. This didn't go over very well in New York and New Jersey, where a lot of things were going on at the time. That whole area of Astoria there being a film hub. In 1908, Edison and Eastman Kodak built the Edison Trust, which was a monopoly on all the creativity of the film stock and the actual equipment itself that also hired thugs to go around and make sure that there were no startups daring to use their equipment. In 1908, Kalim Studios produced a great many films. The main star for the Kalim Studios were the Laurel and Hardy films starting in 1914, over a 30 year period, over a 10 year period, there were 30 more studios that set up in the Jacksonville area. So people who you might have heard of that were in films in Jacksonville and through Colleen Studios were Rudolph Valentino, Ethel and Lionel Barrymore, Mary Pickford and Theda Berra, who in 1915 made a film called A Fool, which was shot entirely in my city, where I'm sitting right now, St. Augustine, which is just an hour south of Jacksonville. In 1915, Joseph Engel brought his Metro studio to Jacksonville. That then became part of the conglomeration of MGM, Metro Goldman Mayer, and in 1917, the first feature length film in Technicolor called The Gulf Between was filmed here in Jacksonville. Over 300 films in 10 years. Even more interesting is that segregated films, shall we say, became very known here and after the regular filmmaking business ceased, the race movies, as they were called, continued to be done here. A gentleman by the name of Richard Norman, who lived in Middleburg, Middleburg is still a town, um, still very rural outside of Jacksonville. In 1926, is famous for making a film called The Flying Ace, and it's still in the Library of Congress. The 1918 flu war and politics of the area got rid of the film industry in Jacksonville. Jacksonville became very conservative and the actors and actresses were known for being very flippant and flamboyant and vice running and uh, women were a little too free in their thinking and drinking and sexuality at the time. So actually the, minor the mineral race, mayoral race in 1917 was won by a gentleman who ran on the platform as Jacksonville will not be ruled by this shady film industry anymore. And he won. So the film industry scooted for the most part. So a little more relativity. Transportation at the time, the bridges weren't built, there were ferries. The Main Street Ferry left from the foot of what is now the Main Street Bridge. Actually, it's a place called The Landing now, um, over across the river to Dixieland every seven and a half minutes and was known to be quite full. I was not able to find anything that clarified, but I believe that those ferries would have been run on steam. The first bridge was built in Jacksonville in 1921. That was the Acosta Bridge, so 14 years later. And then the Main Street Bridge 
1941, which is my favorite bridge in Jacksonville. It's a low level, um, what do you call it? The bridge turns. It doesn't lift uh, with the bascules, but it actually, the central portion turns. It reminds me of a bridge I love from my hometown of Sacramento, the old I Street Bridge. So at the time, this area was referred to as South Bank. Actually, where Dixieland was is still South Bank, though the neighborhood is referred to as San Marco. It wasn't referred to as San Marco at the time. Now, sadly enough, the South Bank at the time for many years became the dumping ground for old vessels. Um, had they run aground or sometimes people just abandon their ships. Still to this day, you'll find sailboats just left and abandoned. The South Bank side became a place where it was like a dumping ground for vessels or damaged vessels. And in 1905, the riverfront there was bulkheaded and filled in with earth and debris. Much of the debris was old ships. Some of them were old ferries. And this is all what created the land that Dixieland was built on and what all the hotels over there are built on now as well. All that remains of that, and you've seen the picture in the slideshow, is um, the Crown Plaza and the Hilton. That's where Dixieland was. The last ferry crossed the St. John's River from Jacksonville to Southside, February 15th of 1938, crossing from what is currently the landing under the Main Street Bridge. So that was before the Main Street Bridge was built, but it was after the Acosta Bridge was built. In 1860, there were two railways in the region, in the county. The thing that Henry Flagler is noted for doing was not building the railroads in Florida, which a lot of people mistake. He didn't build them. There were many railroads here. What he is responsible for doing is organizing them and unifying them into one big company. Each of the railroads in Florida ran on different gauges of track. So you couldn't have one train running from one railroad system to another because the trains wouldn't run on the different gauges of track. What he's attributed for doing is retracking all of that and retooling all of the railroad cars so that you could indeed get on one train and take it all the way to Miami or all the way across the state, at least down to Cedar Key, which is in the Sarasota area on the Gulf Coast. So in 1860, there were two railways, uh, the Florida East Coast Railway, that was the Flagler system, completed the 351 mile mainland Jacksonville to Miami track in 1889. So unfortunately, this unification of the railroad really had an impact on tourism here for Dixieland. It helped tourism in other places of Florida, South Florida, which was booming and greatly built and improved by Flagler's system, but it killed these older attractions. So Dixieland closed in 1917 due to the Second World War, or the First World War, excuse me, the First World War continued storm damage, a second hail storm in 1912, and as sometimes things happen, fires kept happening at the park. Attendance was already dwindling, and unlike that first hailstorm, there just wasn't enough motivation or attraction to finding the money to restore it. So they let it close. The extensive collection of animals was sold to the alligator farm, which is down here in St. Augustine, that opened in 1893. Uh, those animals were said to be sold 
in the 1930s. The alligator farm is still here. It's on Anastasia Island on the beach side of St. Augustine and still a huge draw. Also World War I created a need for other uses for the land. And after everything was closed down and torn down, the shipyard was expanded over there. The movies production company leaving in 1911 had a huge impact on the attraction to Dixieland over time as well. The only thing that continued to stand aside from the Treaty Oaks, which is now in a park in San Marco, the neighborhood of San Marco, was the Dixie Theater. It had been converted into a roller rink and stood as a roller rink until 1964. It was turned down to make room for a nine story apartment building. And as I mentioned before, the Ford Motor Company factory in Jacksonville uh, changed the way that people thought about trolleys and used trolleys. That was built in 1922. It was already in the works to change the concept of public transportation in this type of way. And in 1932, San Marco, the area that is actually the name of the neighborhood, was annexed to the city. So trolley parks as a marble. There are many different ways to look at trolley parks. I have a, a screenshot here in the slideshow of my friend Michelle's wonderful video about trolley parks and they're being a little more meaningful than what we are told they are. Just like the World's Fairs have a lot more story and history to tell us. Uh, when that slide comes around, I would suggest you pop on over to Michelle Gibson's page and watch that and all of her other wonderfully thorough, incredibly well-researched nerdy, fabulous videos. But an interesting part of the gay 90s, we are to believe, along with the concept of, at least in the case of Jacksonville, there was a pre, a post fire renaissance. So this gay 90s renaissance mentality brought an opportunity in the consciousness for downtime or the concept of earned leisure. And that is to have been a huge selling point for all of that. South Bank, where Dixieland was, was actually first developed in 1793 as a plantation owned by the Isaac family. Jacksonville at the time was called Cow Pass or Cow Ford, where you would ford the cows across the river. As I had mentioned before, in 1846 was the Great Havana Gale, as they called it, which is a category five storm, which decimated everything. Electricity was coming in to the concept of people, but it wasn't in everybody's house. It wasn't in every store. 1859, Jacksonville saw their first telegraph office that was improved in 1874 by Edison's improvement with electricity. And so the fact that they could go to Dixieland that was lit and had electrical things like electrical water fountains and you didn't have to go home because it was dark or, or smell smoky soot. It was, just, it was just fascinating. The lights alone were fascinating and marvelous to people. In 1889, part of Flagler's contribution to rail in Florida was extending the Jacksonville to Daytona route. That 
helped somewhat the expanse of Dixieland because people could take the train up from there. So the morbid part, infantoriums. A French gentleman by the name of Alexander Lyon is attributed with creating the first human incubator or infant incubator, I should say. There were incubators prior to that that were used for chicken eggs and premature farm animals. This was in 1896 and he displayed it at the Berlin Industrial Exhibition. It used hot water. Now, what was different about the human incubators was the installation of a large glass window so you could view the baby. And that was something that was created by Martin Cunet. And he was not a doctor. He did not create these for medical reasons as Alexander Leon had. He created this simply as a paid attraction for a fair. Part of his hustle, his game plan, his business plan was to turn these fairs and trolley parks and whatnot into, shall we say, community hospitals. He would put his incubators into these fairs with trained staff, doctors and nurses, and encourage people from the areas to bring in their premature babies where they would be cared for. So it was a hustle. And then the money was made in the people who came in to see the babies in the incubators. So that's going down a whole nother road, orphan trains. I'll leave that right there wonderful videos by other researchers out there. Autodidactic, Campbell at Autodidactic did some marvelous videos about that. Several people did. Most of the early incubators were too expensive to put in hospitals. It just, the hospitals didn't make enough money to afford the incubators. So, this was a workable hustle and Mr. Cunet was able to pull it off, especially after he was able to show that survival rate for premature babies jumped from 15% to 75% after being placed in an incubator. The whole thing was heat, ventilation and nutrition. That was his whole side show hustle. So between 1896 and 1994, there were 80,000 premature babies treated in the infantoriums in amusement parks. It was considered equitable health care for the poor. The Coney Island infantorium was the most famous. But I have some photos that you have seen in here from the Wonderland park which was in Minneapolis. It closed in 1911. Mr. Coney died in poverty in the 1930s doing all this work without a medical degree and after hospitals started considering including incubators after all of his work at the fairs proved so successful he tried to donate all of his incubators to the hospitals and they declined his offer. So I'm going to start just going through here. I have finished all my reading. Thank you for listening. Now, this is a, a nice old photo of the tree oaks and the colored lights in there. I don't know exactly when this photo was taken, but it's fairly contemporary. Um, that's what, and it's very impressive to walk under this magnificent tree. This was a postcard. This is where we started. This was a postcard. 
showing the ostrich. The ostriches were a very famous draw, as were the alligators. There still are ostrich farms in Florida. I don't know if there are any in Jacksonville, not Jacksonville proper, but perhaps out in the country. There are some um, west, closer to Daytona, that I've um, been past myself, but they were a huge draw at the time. Don't have a date, but beautiful painting of Dixieland all alight. You know, what's interesting, as is the case with many of those things, I wasn't able to find uh, details into construction of all of these marvelous things. And um, gosh, oh gee, doesn't that look Moorish? <laughs> And look at that, bell towers, cymatic resonators. This is the building that stands on part of what was Dixieland, um, the Crown Plaza, and then the Hilton is also where Dixieland was. Here's another great watercolor. I'm sorry, I don't have dates for any of these. And I'm not sure what all of these things are. There's looks like that's like a, one of those swing rides. I think that would have been the Dixie Theater. I'm not sure. There, uh, I really gave you everything there is out there about this place. I'm I'm sorry there wasn't more. Here's a lovely old ferry. I'm thinking it was steam, but was it coal? I don't know. Somebody who looks at this will know better than I. Just a lovely old fairy, and I don't know exactly when this was taken, but the fairies ran until just before the Main Street Bridge was built, as I said. Now we have some of the pro players. It looks like this was taken in 1910, I think. Uh, some of the pro players that came down for spring training. I don't know who that is. I think we all know that that's Babe Ruth. And again, um, part of Dixieland's appeal was, was it was built next to this ballpark that already stood and was already known as a spring training ground. So it drew, as you can see, <laughs> a lot of people came for spring training. Uh, this being the Jacksonville team at the time. Here we go, the Jacksonville team, South Atlantic League. And lovely photo of the stands there at the park. People coming for spring training. Another shot, a lot of people in there. You can see uh, the bulkhead. And of course, I don't know how much of this is Phil, but a good bit clearly was Phil. Quite an undertaking, right? Uh, suspicious, of course, because there is not anything that I could find. I mean, I could have looked harder, but nothing that I could find about the details of the building or who built it or even who owned it. I guess the city. I'm not sure when this photo was taken, but this is just to give you some relativity. This is Jacksonville over here. I think that's the Blue Cross Blue Shield building. I'm not sure, but this is Jacksonville proper over here. This is the Main Street Bridge. So this is where the ferry used to cross. This is South Bank, and this is where Dixieland would have been. This is the Acosta Bridge over here. No, I think that's the Prudential Building, actually. Is that the Prudential Building? I don't know, I can't tell. Anyway, this is just for uh, relativity 
I guess this looks to have been before they built the landing, which um, was kind of a restaurant and gift shop and touristy wall uh, waterfront kind of place. Um, it, uh, I don't think it was ever very successful or it wasn't very successful for very long, but there are great views. And um, yeah, so this is where the ferry would have run. Now I can tell you that there is still a ferry that you can take. Um, it's more like a water taxi. You can't drive your car on it like the old ferries did over the years. Certainly it wasn't a car carrying ferry when Dixieland was open, but um, there is still a water taxi that you can take from underneath the Main Street Bridge and the landing over to, it takes you over, um, it takes you over here to this side of the Main Street Bridge where there's a big fountain that Jacksonville is famous for. I think it's called the Friendship Fountain. It's a huge fountain and it has lights and the water lights up. And uh, this has since been developed into uh, an attraction with restaurants. And then the water taxi would also take you further down out of the frame of the photo to where the arena is. I don't know if that's still running. Um, it might only run when there are games. I don't know, but you still can take a water taxi across. So if you're downtown and you don't have a car and you want to come over here and get some shrimp or crab or something at one of the the restaurants over here on this side or um, come down here to San Marco and have some wine tasting or that type of thing, then uh, that's a possibility. There's also uh, a Skyway a tram that there's a, a bridge now that, well, it's the bridge over here. I can't remember the name of the bridge, but it's a, a much higher bridge and the tram runs on over here and will take you over to San Marco. So, what does that look like to you? It looks like the entrance or to a building of one of many world spares, right? Arch, magnificent Tartarian Moorish brickwork resonating chamber, red mercury ball, bell tower, plasma collector, plasma collector, plasma collector, arch, plasma collector, plasma collector, red mercury battery. Yeah, right? Look at that, arches. Who found this? We don't know, but you know it was found. You know it was found. This is just kind of a cool photo. This building still stands. I can't remember the name of it, but um, the old part, uh, you know, the, the older part of Jacksonville and town, the town of Jacksonville, the old part around Hebbings Park. There are beautiful old buildings, gorgeous old buildings that survived the fire, but it's just giving you an idea of how things looked then. So this is town, this is south side and you see the ferry boats and the old baseball park. I guess that's coal. I thought they might've run on steam, but that looks like they're coal burning to me. I think I included that one twice, sorry about that. So here's the old Dixie Theater, which in the end apparently was the only thing that survived and it survived at a, as a roller skating rink. Here we've got the octagon rotunda, 
with the old plasma spire, which we know from our free energy research that this was a very important part of the grid. That's why it was an octagon. All the plasma collectors up here, and of course, the cymatic resonating chambers there. I can't read what that says. But this would have been one of, this must have been the laughing house, obviously. I'm not sure what this one was, but look at all this beautiful Moorish work. That's the slide. <laughs> Man, that's thrilling for the early 1900s. Another beautiful Moorish roof there. And the incubators. Let's build incubators with big glass windows so people can look in with morbid curiosity at premature babies that have been essentially abandoned to be cared for. This was a postcard of Wonderland Park, um, the one that I mentioned, another trolley park that, uh, was known for its infantorium. And here we have one of the nurses taking care of one of the babies that you could just walk by and gawk out with morbid curiosity. In what used to be Wonderland in Minneapolis, this is all that remains. In Jacksonville, all that remains of Dixieland is the Treaty Oak and all that remains of Wonderland in Minneapolis is this building which served as the infantorium. It's now an apartment building. Just think about that for a minute. It's an apartment building. That's almost as horrifying as in a previous video I did of in St. Augustine here, where we had a museum that was a devoted to human morbidity and tragedy is now a Montessori school. This is almost as bad. Do you think that these people know when they move into this building what it was originally for and what it held? I doubt it. Oof. Beautiful, beautiful. And the ostriches. Now the ostriches, <laughs> were a huge draw. Of course, all the animals you will remember were here at Dixieland Park for the movie industry. The ostriches were put to good use for things like ostrich races. Huge draw. Just walk right up and pet an ostrich. Not sure, ostrich races. I'm sh not sure what, I guess it had to have been like movies about Africa that the ostriches were in. I don't know. I don't know if people were eating ostrich meat or ostrich eggs at the time as that's something now, but nonetheless, they were a huge draw. And of course they ended up on that very phoneless postcard with the gators in the lagoons and the ostriches as fascinating appeal babies baby ostriches that's a lovely one looking back across the river at the city of jacksonville and some of these buildings are still here i'm happy to say See if we can figure out. Oh, this is the Palace of Industry. Okay. Florida Industry. So this was in the part of the park, you know, like um, World's Fairs where they had all this. They had one about transportation and one about uh, Florida produce and all that good stuff. Like, yeah, uh-huh, sure. This was built. Yep. This was built just to house industry. Look at plasma collectors. Bell towers. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yep. 
Sure. There's that battery cell, or I wonder, would have this been the solenoid and the circuitry? I'm not sure. And looking across at Jacksonville. That is. I wonder if that was an old water tower. I don't know. I think this building is still there. Some of these are still there. There's something way out in the distance there. The waterfront looks very different now. So the cafe and dancing pavilion. Yes, of course there was wonderful fresh food and a big dance hall. And that was another thing. There was always Dixieland music playing in Dixieland. And uh, John Philip Sousa, you know, Stars and Stripes Forever is, was a, a big time player here. But just look at all this detail. Give me a freaking break. So that's a young planted tree that was brought in young palm, but look at this. I mean, come on, come on. If that isn't some kind of resonator and you see all this Moorish stuff here that's all filled in, yeah, right. Yeah, you know, I don't, I wonder, I wonder if this was a dirigible port, I wonder, it might not be high enough. Maybe not a really big Zeppelin like the Gaff Zeppelin, but man, that totally looks like a dirigible moor, doesn't it? And we're looking across the river at Jacksonville. Oh, that's the cathedral. That's what that is. That's what that is. And uh, a lot of those old AKA churches are still there. That's going to be another video. I'm going to drive up to Jacksonville one day and take pictures of all the beautiful old churches. But yeah, this looks like a dirigible bay. Okay, so this is my friend, Michelle Gibson. And this is the video that I was talking about, revealing the significance of historical trolley parks in the United States. Please, 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 if this has been of any interest to you whatsoever, would you please go to Michelle Gibson's YouTube channel. I'm not sure if she's on Rumble like me, but um, yes, please go to her channel and watch this and you will be just blown away amazed. She is much more professional than I and uh, her videos are of much higher quality than mine. <laughs> Very inspirational to me. She is, she is, she is. There's the old treaty oak with the old lighting. And uh, this is the entrance to the park. All that's left of Dixieland Park is the Treaty Oak. I love that um, it wasn't the city of Jacksonville or San Marco that preserved this. It was people who purchased the land over the years to preserve the tree. Some people standing under it at the time. And I think that's where we started. Yep, that's where we started. So thank you. Thank you for hanging out with me again. None of my videos are ever short. I hope that you enjoyed this stroll down the Coney Island of the South and uh, learned more than you knew you wanted to know about Trolley Parks, Dixieland, the history of the movie business in Florida, Tartaria, orphan trains, infantoriums, any of those things. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I appreciate you. This is Medusa was framed saying good night, wishing you a good one. And I'll see you next time.